Uh, the build, the super brawl begins in Columbus with uh, Ric Flair going crazy saying he's going to wrestle Hogan at super brawl for the title. And he puts his hair up for a match with you. And we've seen a lot over the years where people would say, Hey, we're not sure what'll get a rating. Just let flair wrestle sting. It always gets, me. Yeah. but it feels like in this, this era, Hey, we're not sure what to do. Let's get back with flair and Hogan. It's the match that put us on the map on pay-per-view. It'll do it again. And I'll be damned if it doesn't work here. Who do you think deserves the credit for going back to the well one more time with Hogan and Flair? And what do you mean deserves the credit in what way? Well, I, I'm saying sometimes people would say, oh, we've seen that match before. Uh, we're looking for new matches. I get that. But on the other hand, like it's been bankable since 1994. Here we are five years later. Why not do Flair and Hogan again? I just think there's certain... I mean, it's kind of like Paul and Oates. Yeah. And it just fit together. It just works. It just did. And I, I, I don't think it's fair or, or accurate to give either one of them credit. I think Rick's ability to be passionate is Rick is, I mean, he wears his passions on his sleeve in real life and, and in the ring. And because of Rick's intense passion, you, he can make you forget that you've seen that match before. Yes. As long as there's a different reason for it, a different issue on the table, Rick can make you forget everything else that's ever happened. So in that sense, I think as an opponent, particularly when it comes to the narrative it takes to drive interest in a match, how do you not tip your hat to Ric Flair? That's what he was best at. Is creating passion and emotion. Um, Hogan, because of their history, because he was Hulk Hogan, it was it was the, the chemistry was built in. The story was really there. You have to craft much, just build off the history to a large degree. And the who's the best in the business? Who's the best that ever was? Hogan could lay claim, and arguably so could Ric Flair. So you've got you've got two of the very best in the world at that time, and not only the best in the world at that time. When when I say best, maybe maybe not physically in the ring and being able to go out there and you know perform athletically at a super high level and do all kinds of crazy shit, um, but in terms of the story telling the ring history, the drama that came along with it, just as a result of being Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan, it's a, you know, like I said, it's a hollow notes thing. It's, it was just magic. I hard to pin it on any one person. Let's talk about Jericho. Meltzer would say the Jericho situation remains the same. There's personal hate because backstage Jericho's or Bischoff is claiming Jericho virtually agreed to a deal a ways back, but now he won't sign it. Meanwhile, the That's WWF right. has made Jericho their number one priority as, as far as acquiring any new piece of talent. He was in Buffalo, but was told he wouldn't be used at Nitro, and there are rumors that he's going to receive a $750,000 offer, but to the best of my knowledge, he actually hasn't received the offer. It doesn't appear likely the WWF will match that offer or can even come close, but the WWF also has some obvious advantages when it comes to someone in his position. So let's talk about this. Did you feel like you had a verbal with Chris or, or were you trying to find things to entice him or was the bloom completely off the rose here? None of the above. I, I, I was trying, well, maybe you covered it. I was trying hard to keep Chris. I didn't want Chris to leave. Dave's reporting once again was completely false or he was fed that information. Uh, perhaps by Chris. I don't know. I did make an offer pretty substantial offer to Chris. I believe it was closer to 500. Um, I don't, it may have been 750. You know, it's 25 years ago. So fuck, I don't know. But I, I don't think it was quite that high, but I was trying, you know, and I didn't have the same budget I had previously. Right. At this time, things were, things Changing. had been, 
they started changing in the fourth quarter of 98. And by first quarter of 99, it was just ass ugly in terms of what happened to my budget. So I was, but I did the best I could do, but I didn't. And this is the part that I take exception with because again, it was a lie and misrepresentation. Um, I didn't think that I had a verbal. First of all, I don't consider a verbal agreement worth having a conversation about. Verbal agreements don't mean a thing. I was trying hard to keep Chris. I didn't think that we had a meeting of the minds in any way, shape, or form, orally or otherwise. I was trying to get to that because I didn't want Chris to leave. But there was no heat between Chris and I. Zero, I mean, there may have been frustration on Chris's part, really. Not on mine. My frustration is I really want to keep this guy, and, I, and I'm working my ass off to do it, and it doesn't seem to be working. But there was no personal heat. I didn't blame Chris. I wasn't angry with Chris. I understood what Chris was attempting to do and why he was attempting to do it. But the idea that I thought we had a deal and there's heat because he told me he was going to such, you know, childlike reporting on behalf of useful wasn't true. Uh, you are going to be uh, on your heels a little bit here. Raw at this point has extended their winning streak over Nitro for 13 consecutive weeks. And I'm wondering, did that make you feel a certain type of way? I mean, obviously you've been to the top of the mountain, beat Vince once, beat him multiple times. There was a streak but maybe you got a comfortable after 83 consecutive weeks. And when you find yourself losing 13 consecutive weeks in a row, is it just another day at the office? Is it getting to you mentally? Do you feel that pressure professionally? Talk to me about that. Overall, I, I was definitely feeling the pressure, not so much in losing 13. You know, it wasn't like we were sitting around going, Oh my God, they beat us again. Things were bad enough overall in, in, in all aspects of the, not just in terms of the television ratings, but WCW overall was in a, in a, in a very bad situation internally. And this was just like one more straw run on the camel's back, so to speak. It wasn't something that we all sat down at the next day when the ratings come on and went, Oh my God, I can't believe this. What are we going to do? It wasn't that this was just one more thing that had been happening for quite a while that added to the overall sense of frustration and stress in WC. We, and I, uh, I, I take exception to the fact I never got comfortable. I mean, you didn't have time to get too comfortable. Did, was I, did I get to a point at some time, say probably 97, perhaps early 98, where I was perhaps overconfident? Yeah. Yes. Maybe that, maybe. But wait a minute. Comfortable? Wait. Hang on. Comfortable? No. You weren't, you weren't comfortable getting flooded down from the ceiling on a fucking Harley Davidson? Looked pretty comfortable to me wearing your crown. I was comfortable. And again, that was during a period of time when we were kind of on top of the world, but comfortable to me is complacency. Okay. And we weren't, we weren't complacent. Okay. I wasn't complacent. That's fair. I, I, I meant comfortable to be, uh, cocky, confident. Um, yeah, I was confident and I was cocky, but that was part of my character, but behind the scenes, did I ever say, oh, fuck, I don't have, we don't have to worry about this shit anymore. Oh, we're so good at this. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, call me on Tuesday. I want to take a couple of days. No. Well, it was never, I it was get, never that. Maybe you didn't say that, but you were also telling people, I'm going to drive a stake through his heart. I'm going to force him into bankruptcy. He's going out of this. And, and I, I did. I did say those things. That was my misguided way of kind of rally the team. Sure. I thought everybody would feel the same way I felt. I wanted to be number one. Right. That's the only thing that I gave a fuck about is being number one. And not just in terms of television ratings, but there were other things that we weren't number one at all that, you know, the period of time where, you know, we were beating them 83 weeks or 84 weeks, whatever it was in a row. We beat them a total over a couple of year period of about 104 weeks. You know, so, I mean, there was, we had stacked up a lot of wins on television 
but they were still outperforming us in other areas, certainly internationally, certainly when it came to licensing and merchandising. We weren't even close. We weren't even a distant number two when it came to licensing and merchandising, even with the emergence of the NWO merchandise that we got hot. Even with the millions of dollars that we were selling over in Japan, we never came close to where WWE was, even while we were embarrassing them on TV every week. They still had a more robust business than we did in so many different areas. That was my goal, is to be number one and not just on television. And I thought by being that over-the-top, super aggressive I mean, that's who I am. If I decide I want to go after something, I tend to go for the throat. I don't start at somebody's feet and work my way up. I right for the throat. And that's the way I approach the business. And I thought mistakenly that others would kind of rally around that over-the-top way of saying, I want to be number one. And they actually didn't. <laughs> it was not, not the, uh, and not a highlight reel for my management experience. 